Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, how's everybody doing? It's been quite an adventure for me trying to teach my classes this semester. I never, I never quite know what's going to work and what's not going to work. Um, okay, is there any, any questions that anybody had on uh, the course itself, content? Yeah, Dr. Ma uh, Dr. Scott, I had a question about homework, at least for us at BYU. Yes. yes. Um, is there a format that we should be doing those, and is there a way we should be turning them in at next Monday? Yeah, so what I'm going to – they just need to be neat enough that the graders can follow easily what, what you're trying to say. Um, and, of course, as, as is the case with any homework problem, your job is to convince the reader that you – have solved the problem. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Learning Suite and add an ass a couple of assignments, and you can go ahead and scan and just upload those to Learning Suite. Perfect. And then the homework. So are those assignments going to be on Learning Suite, or are they the exercises at the end of the notes on the wiki? They are always going to be the exercises at the end of each wiki section. Okay. Perfect. So in this case, there's 11 problems. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Yep. Dr. Scott, I have a quick question. Um, for the textbook, is that still like, um, I guess, recommended to read? And if so, like, are the corresponding sections with what we're going over in class that's on the wiki and stuff? So the textbook is by Tom Hughes, and I would say at this, at, at, for this course, I would view it more as a reference than a a text that we're following. Okay. Be, if, you, if there's a concept you run into and you want a little more information, you probably can find it in that book. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So we left off, we were talking about, um, We were talking about energy, energy spaces. So what part of my, can, is it just the whiteboard that you guys see right now? Correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, energy spaces. So what is an energy space? Well, basically an energy space was developed to allow people to find solutions to problems that looked something like this. Okay, so the question then is, what is you? And for a long time, it was assumed that they were just classical functions, you know, continuously differentiable, um, you know, things that, that you could apply standard uh, integral and differentiable calculus to. But then it turned out that there were a lot of problems where this wasn't the case, and so more gen generic or general ideas needed to be um, developed to model these functions. Okay, and so let's define now what we call um, Hilbert or 
more specifically Sobolev spaces. Okay. Let's first define what we call um, L2 spaces. So L2, I guess it can be, it's going to be all those functions W such that when you take W and you square it and then you integrate it, that's a finite value. Okay, and so we call these functions square integrable. Okay, and so this, this is a Hilbert space. And it's actually also a Sobolev space. Okay, so L2 is a very common space. Uh, one way to think about it is it's like the space of functions that don't have to be continuous at all. So you, it includes the discontinuous functions along with a lot of other exotic functions. Okay, now let's define all of the Sobolev spaces. So let's say we're going to use the uppercase H for a Sobolev space, H to the K, where K is going to be a variable. That's going to be all the functions W such that W is an L2 function. W prime is an L2 function. And then W to the K is an L2 function. So I really, one of the things I'm really trying to accomplish is to give engineers an intuition behind what these objects are, because it's, you know, it's one thing to be proving theorems, and it's another thing to be like designing methods and trying to solve problems. And in that setting, the intuition becomes important. Let me ask you this question. Why would we be interested in functions like h to the k, where k is some number of derivatives. Like, can somebody motivate this? Like, why, why we're so interested in the derivatives being in what we call L2, or they have well-defined integrals? Like, what, what's the intuition here? Somebody help me out. Integrable functions have uh, complete metric spaces, so we'll be able to know how close things are together. Okay, yeah, that's that's. I don't, I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but no, it's it, it's it's a true statement. You know, in returning just just to the idea of a Hilbert space, it has that structure. My question is beyond that structure of there being an inner product and a norm and metric and all that. Why this? Like, why are we Sobolev spaces really? They're all about derivatives behaving themselves. Why? Like, remember, this whole field is motivated by trying to solve physical problems. Like, we're really trying to develop mathematical models for real problems. Tell me something about functions that model real problems like what is the function wh what is the function that you've encountered most in terms of using it in your engineering lives well, well mike in my experience physics is continuous is that what you're aiming at here okay they, that you're getting there okay so one word is maybe there's some level of continuity okay so just so I'll that the in, I'll put this in print in uh, quotes because even here, this isn't classical continuity, right? It, it just means that the derivative, if you integrate it, it's less than infinity, right? It's not that it has to be a continuous function like this. You know, it can look like this now. Okay. So 
tell me a little bit, is, did anybody else want to add to that, to what uh, Curtis just said? Um, I was going to say that it's, it's just so that the space in which you're looking to minimize your function, like the solution is defined in there. Um, like, I don't know, you take, for example, the Dirichlet energy, you know, involving uh, first order derivatives, you want to make sure all of those are integrable. Otherwise, um, <laughs> you, you know, you're going to have infinite values for, yeah, okay. for certain functions. Okay. Tell, let me, yeah, go ahead. Somebody's going to say something. Sorry to interrupt. There's a comment in the, or the, in the chat from Enki Luo. She says, or I'm not sure if it's, uh, but they say existence and uniqueness. Okay. That, yeah, but I'm, what I'm after, guys, I'm after intuition. That's the most valuable thing that you have. Intuition. I, my intuition's always guided by the equations of motion. Okay. And I suppose I would, I would say that if you, can, if you control derivatives, you can then control like the energy. There you go, Greg. That's, that's the kernel of this whole thing, right? Uh, what Ryan said is right. You want things with finite energy, right? That's a basic prerequisite. But the it's in the derivatives that you find the energy in systems, right? It's, it's the way that the derivatives behave, how fast they blow up, um, how smooth they are, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a reason that these are called energy spaces. It's because the natural functions that model things in nature, first of all, they have to be in some sense bounded. The energy has to be finite. And um, you have to have some control over the energy of the derivatives. Okay, so the word that I would use is the energy in the derivatives. And so this is a really critical idea that really if you develop a strong intuition about this, these spaces begin to become less mysterious as far as why we're using them. Um, okay, so notice also that now when we are saying a derivative, W prime, no longer does W prime have to be in some, you know, C1 space, like space of uh, continuously differentiable functions, it's an L2, which means that the derivative, right, if we were to look at we're just saying that W prime integrated has to be less than infinity. And now all of a sudden, this idea of a derivative becomes much more general. And we'll actually call these generalized derivatives. And as we talked about yesterday on Monday, what was discovered is that a lot of these integral equations, you can't actually find their solutions in the classical CK spaces. And so HK spaces were developed, which have more functions in them, and they're more general, the derivative behavior. So a nice intuition here, one that I think about is, and let me, let me, let me ask this in the form of a question, how are the CK and the HK spaces like related to each other? Just, just at a high level, just an, an intuitive, not looking for a theorem. There are theorems that of course answer this question, but just because you can restate the theorem doesn't mean that you know what it means. Okay, so what, how are these guys related? Well, it seems like CK is a subset or subspace of HK. Um, and from your notes, it said that there were additional functions um, that aren't as strongly differentiable in exactly. HK. Yeah, so CK is contained in HK, and it, it has a whole bunch of other functions that are like almost CK, except at some isolated points, okay? And so it's essentially, there's this very close 
relationship between the classical differentiable spaces, the CK spaces, and then these more generic energy spaces. And so mm -hmm. when we get to finite elements, what you'll notice is that we often are working in here in order to approximate functions in here. And the reason we do that is because there is this very close relationship between these spaces. Okay, let me uh, scroll. Dr. Scott, yep. could you help me? I have a question on what you just stated there. So why, why would we want to approximate those additional functions in HK um, just to help with the intuition? Uh, well, what, what's, their, what's their importance with finite elements? Because we're okay. working in CK because we can, but then we want to get these additional functions from HK. Well, right. yeah, in finite elements, it's all about computing functions that are, you want to deal with functions that are easy to compute. And so that's why we live in, we tend to work in CK because it's very easy to generate a space of CK functions for a very generic geometry. And we also know that an infinite sequence of, you can, you can approximate any function with enough polynomials. Right. And so um, that's kind of the idea, right? And so you just generate these larger and larger polynomial spaces and you begin to be able to approximate very well uh, functions in these more general Sobolev spaces. So we, we, we don't really know how necessarily to discretize directly HK, right? but we do understand how to discretize uh, what we call splines, right? In the context of a spline method, like the finite element method. Mike, that, can I ask uh, a question? A question or did I miss it? So I, I understand that we can work in CK space and we can approximate HK, but um, I guess application wise, what are those functions in HK um, either look like or I guess why do we want to approximate those certain functions in HK? When oh. We can... oh yeah, it's because boundary value problems, their solutions live in H in the in the in the H spaces. That's right. That that's that's the fundamental thing is that that's where the boundary value problem solutions naturally live is in the H in the Sobolev spaces. It's like a step function or a delta function would be a yep. good example. Yep. Yep. I, yeah, thank you. Thank that's, you. Right. That's that's how you tie that back to that. It's like, it's just the mathematics has indicated as they've studied boundary value problems that these solutions they they live in these more generic spaces, uh, and so analytically it's nice to know that. But then from a numerical point of view, we don't really know how to discretize HK directly, and so we do it by means of polynomials, usually speaking. Does that answer your question, Ian? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Mike, can I ask a question as well? Sure. So can you give, when you say CK is classically differentiable, can you remind me exactly what that means? I mean, I mostly know what it means, but like exactly. And then can you provide an example from physics that's intuitive about how the solution is not in the CK space, it's strictly in the HK space, so that we kind of have a strong intuition about what you really mean by this. Okay, yeah, so a C, let's say a C1 function, so if we have some F in C1, and uh, it's defined over, let's say, some domain omega, so F, at x, let's say to the left of, you know, right, like within some epsilon ball of x has to be equal to f x to the right, right? So we're basically looking at limits converging from the left and to the right. So if this, this is the first condition, this is sufficient to be in C0, right? It's a C0 function if this holds for all x in omega. Is that okay, Curtis? Do you, do you see what that means? Yep, following that. Mm -hmm. And then F prime, F prime X to the right, this is C1. 
Okay, so to be a C1 function, you have to be a C0 function, uh, and you have to have this uh, second condition on the derivatives. And so we, we, if this holds, we say that this function is continuously differentiable. Okay, and then this, this just keeps going down, you know, C to the K. All right, so that's what we mean by classical, these classical continuous spaces are these kinds of spaces where you're taking limit, you take, go to a point X and you look at the limits coming from the left and to the right. And if they're unique and the same, then you have on the, all the derivatives up to the Kth derivative, then you're in CK. Okay, then what was the second part of your question? Um, I want to know, I, I was hoping you could provide a, a physics example where it's obvious that the solution is strictly HK, but not CK. So that way I can understand the limits of our CK approximations. Right. Um, let's see. Let's see. That's a good question. An example of a... A, a point load on a beam. Yes, Kyle. That's a good one. So like so a wire? Say, instead of have a beam. Let's say you have a beam. And you have some load P at a point. Right? So the, this, the solution to this is not a classically differentiable function. Because you're, you're essentially applying a load at a single discrete point. So you're saying that this is not a C, but it is with an H? That's correct. So what, would a more intuitive example be the wave equation for a wire because your slope is clearly discontinuous since you have no bending resistance? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like it's, the deformation is shaped like a wire, like a triangle. Uh, well, yeah, so any, the absolute value function is also not a CEK function. Uh, for me, uh, coming from structures, this, this is the most, this is a very simple example here of a function that's not a CK function, a point load on a structure. But the function that you're talking about is the function of the load on the structure, the forces within the beam? Of the displacement. So if you were to the, the displacement of this guy, Okay. As a function of X, this guy would not be in a CK space. Well, C1. It'd be in C0, right? Mm -hmm. it would not be in C1. Right? But it would be in H1. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So there's an example. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a good question. I think I'm going to add that to my notes. Um, to maybe I'll just work this problem and then we can see where it is. Maybe um, if you use like Green's functions to come up with solutions uh, to a problem before, like if you apply the differential operator to the Green's function, then you get a delta function. Yep, that's another classic way of coming up with analytic solutions to these guys. And what you'll find is that these methods will produce a lot of non-CK uh, functions. Is that, is that okay, Curtis? I, yeah, I'm following what you're saying and I'm still digesting it. Yeah, thank okay. you. So let's talk about what we mean by um, these derivatives, right? Like the derivatives being in L2. We call these weak derivatives. And again, it's important to have some um, intuition to guide you here. So what I wanna do is um, give you um, an example. 
and I, I work an example in the course notes that I'll repeat here. Let's, let's look at the absolute value function x um, on omega equal minus one to one. Okay, so the graph, the function looks like this. And then we want to uh, show that this guy is not in C1. So it's not going to be in C1, but then we're going to show that it actually is in H1, meaning it doesn't have a classical first derivative, but it has a generalized first derivative. And this will help you see exactly what we mean by uh, a weak derivative. Okay, so um, let me clear this here. Okay, so here we go. So a week, so if you have u and v, and again, for you engineers who are thinking this is way more math than you wanted, this isn't the whole course. So let me, I just wanna reiterate that um, I just have learned over the years, it's better to just eat your vegetables first and then we'll enjoy the dessert after. <laughs> so I'm gonna try and go through the math and then what, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to return to these concepts again and again throughout the course and you'll, you'll, you'll continue to stre strengthen them. Okay, so if U and V are integrable, let's say on A, B, uh, we, the, what we say is that we say V is a weak derivative oops, of u if the integral from a b u phi prime dx is equal to the negative d, d, dx over all um, phi in c infinity B at A equal C at B equal to zero. Okay, so that is, this is the definition and it's not, there. It, it, it's not, I'm not completely rigorous here, but it's enough to, for you to see what's going on here. So if, if you wanna know what the weak derivative of U is, the way that you compute it or determine what it is, is you take U and we say you test it. And that means you integrate u against all phi in C infinity. These are like little bumps throughout the domain, right? They're zero on the endpoints, and then there, there are all these little C infinity bumps, smooth bumps that you can test u against. And essentially what phi is doing is it's, it's basically filtering out for you the information about u. So we're reconstructing the function u by testing it against a whole bunch of infinitely differentiable functions. And so because phi is infinitely differentiable, we can take its derivative. Notice there's no derivative on u and u is integrable. So this integral is fine. And then what we do is we do integration by parts. So this right here is integration by parts. And all of a sudden, what we can do is we can pass the derivative off of phi and compute what v is under the integral. And then since, and since this holds for every single an infinite number of test functions, we've actually reconstructed the derivative, the weak derivative of u. So do you notice that v, it, it, it is only defined under integration. It, it never stands alone. Right, this isn't a pointwise statement. You don't say anything about V in a pointwise sense. All you're saying is that under the 
under the derivative, uh, under the integral associated with a bunch of test functions, this is what this guy, what this guy looks like. And so let's do an example for the absolute value so that you can see what I'm talking about. All right, so let's look at u equal to the absolute value of x on minus one to one, okay. So let's take this derivative now. So, or this integral, we have minus one to one u b prime dx. Okay, this, def this integral is well defined. Now let's do integration by parts. Let's first insert the definition of the absolute value into u, which gives us minus one to zero of minus x b prime dx plus zero to one x b prime dx. Now we do integration by parts on each of these integrals, right? So we're gonna pass the derivative off of this guy on to this function. Now this function is now differentiable on minus one to zero, right? Notice how we've, we've, we have, in some sense, we've cut out um, the point zero in this integral in some sense, right? And that's an important property of the integration process. So if we do integration by parts, we end up with minus, minus one to zero, minus one phi dx minus zero to one phi dx, okay? And so now we're done. This defines a function, right? So this is our v minus one to one uh, v phi dx, where in this case v is equal to minus one, if we have minus one less than equal to x less than zero, and then one, okay, so this function v clearly is not a C1 function, right? I mean, uh, u is clearly not a C1 function, so it doesn't have a classical first derivative, but it does have a weak derivative. And the weak derivative is the function, it's just the classic step function, right? So it's minus one plus one. Okay, and so this function v here, because it does have a weak derivative, therefore its, its derivative is in L2 and so it's in H1. So this guy is in H1. Okay, so this is really um, this is really important. Like this is just from my perspective, it's just you just have to know this in order to do the engineering and physics that follows because like this is the this is the whole foundation of what where we look for solutions and why we look for them there and what their properties are. Um, is this in? Go question. ahead, Jen. Yep. Is this in H one because? they meet at zero or if they didn't meet at zero would it still be an h1 so what this means the way that to interpret this is that this function do you see how cl how close is this function to being c1 can somebody tell me it's made up of two c1 functions yeah so it's c1 except at zero right yeah and so the integration procedure it's called lebesgue integration What it allows you to do is integrate functions everywhere except at what we call a set of measure zero, which is just like a whole bunch of points. You can basically ignore those. The integral cannot differentiate between two functions that are only different in a set of measure zero, right? So um, 
what the integral is allowing us to do is to basically analyze functions that don't have the classic idea of differentiability through the properties of integration. And so this function, again, remember that I said there's this nice kind of conceptual linking between the CK and the HK spaces. This tells you, this kind of helps you see how close they are, right? So this function is in H1, not in C1, but boy, it's really close to being C1. It's just not C1 on a set of measure zero. So this is the important, like the important point here. And there are a lot of solutions to problems that are going to look like the absolute value function, right? Or have those kinds of discontinuities at certain points. Okay. Just a clarification. V is not in H1, like you wrote down there. It is, it's, but U is. That's what, what you're oh, trying yeah. to yeah. yeah, V is just its derivative. Uh, U, so what we've shown is that U prime is equal to V, and it's actually in L2. That's the right way to say that. So U prime is in L2, U itself is in H1. Okay, any, any more questions on that? Yeah, and in, in the context of splines, using splines, the whole business is building these function spaces, right? So this, this information, which if you just use linear finite elements, like some people don't ever know anything about this because they essentially have only one way of doing approximation with the linear functions. With splines, we have this huge new, like this whole frontier of spaces. And so understanding this information becomes critical. Okay, so let's talk about now just some properties of the Sobolev spaces. I've already said that CK is contained in HK. We also have that HK plus one is contained in HK, okay? So there's less functions, right, in these higher K spaces than there are in the lower K HK spaces. And now the, the question is, we have this, notice that we can say that CK is in HK, but now the question becomes, when is HK contained in some C R space for some R. Let's say R not equal to K. So here's a question. And what does your intuition tell you here? Like if, if CK is really, really, really close to HK in some sense, then what do we think about CK minus one? What's its relationship to HK? What would you think? Or the HK minus one. What, what's the relationship, for example, to um, between HK and not CK, but CK to the minus one? Right, so this this guy is like that, right? Yeah, HK should always exist for CK to the minus one. This is what your intuition would kind of guide you to say, right? Well, if HK is really close to CK and CK to the minus one is bigger than CK, maybe we have hope that HK is actually in CK to the minus one, right? So maybe H1 functions are actually C0 functions. That seems reasonable, right? Notice that the absolute value function, is it a C0 function? Yes. It is a C0 function. So at least for one function, we know that this is true. And so th this is a very, very important like idea and it's made precise through what are called the Sobolev embedding theorems. And it's really 
answering this question of, you know, like how big of a CK space do I need in order for an HK space to live inside of it? That's essentially what, what it's trying to, the, the question that it's trying to answer. Why would this be a nice, why would this be an interesting question from the standpoint of finite elements? How so many you can of you find everything first? under CK under some K, some CK, right? If it's high enough. Yeah. I mean, how many of you? I mean, we have a lot of people working in the labs who have written papers. How many of you have described a method where you said something like, "I'm going to look for a solution in H1, and I'm going to test it against like delta U's in H1." Anybody ever written this in a paper, and then you've described your method? And then what kind of finite elements do you use in order to find the solution? What space are they usually in? Classical Fusion. finite elements. C, C0. C0 functions, right? This is the classic FEA space. Okay, and the vast majority of problems in structural mechanics, they only require one weak derivative. So they all live in H1. And so that's, this is the motivation for why C0 finite element spaces are so nice. Because if, 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 a, if, if, if we were looking at infinite dimension spaces. So we had an infinite number of C0 functions and an infinite number of H1 functions. We'd actually know this in 1D. So you should be able to compute it exactly if you had an infinite precision machine. Okay, and so the Sobolev embedding theorem says um, if Omega is an open set in R to the N and S is greater than N over two plus K is really the floor. Then H to the S is in C, K, and B, this is just a, this just means bounded. It's just a technicality. All polynomials are bounded, but anyway, all the bounded C, Ks. So if, 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 if we're in R1, if N is equal to one, what do we know from this formula? Quiet group. So I'm just having trouble. Where does the, where does the n come into play? Is that just any integer? Yeah. So n here is the dimension of the space. R1, R2, R3, R4, R5. Right. These are the classic vectors that you will have worked with. You know. N is the dimension. One dimensional, two dimensional. Okay. Okay, so if n is equal to one, then what does this look like? Well, s better be greater than zero plus k. So h1 is in c0, right? h2 is in c1 and so on. And then if n, let's say if n is equal to two, then this becomes one. So then this goes, this one doesn't work. Then this goes to C0. Then H3 is in C1. Do you see the pattern? So for higher dimensions, if 
there are more, there's basically for higher dimensions, there's more and more chance that your functions, your H functions, your Sobolev functions can be really weird, <laughs> right? So like in 1D, there's not a lot of chance that things can go haywire, but in two and 3D, things can get really weird. You can construct really strange functions. And so the embedding becomes weaker and weaker. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? This is the thing about these Zoom meetings. I can't tell. I have no idea how, how you're doing. In terms of the nomenclature that you're using, the R, we've used that for real numbers. What are you using it for this time? This guy. R to the end. Yeah, this is real numbers, real numbers. So these are, so if n is equal to one, that's just the real line, right? R, if R, if we have R2, then it's like everything on the page, right? X, okay. Y, that's R2. So often in this case, containing vectors. Yep, just vectors. X, Y, Z is R3, right? So it's like geometries in, uh, so, in R3, it's like all geometries in the physical world, right? We live in R3. Is that okay? Yep. Good. Any other questions? So with, yep. with, this, with this formula, we're, we're faced with a problem, a physics problem to analyze, and we have H, K problems and we want to fit them into some sort of C, K space so that we can actually make the calculations, right? That's exactly right, yep. Okay. So before you even pick a finite element mesh or a discretization, the very first question that you should answer is, what Sobolev space does, does my solution, should it live in? Like if I look at the integral statement that I'm trying to solve, where is the natural place? What is the HK space? And then that should tell you the minimum CK space, right? Right. Um, but remember, there's a caveat here that, that the Sobolev spaces are infinite dimensional. So to get an exact, you know, an exact representation in a CK space, you would need an infinite number of those functions. In finite elements, we have a finite dimensional space. And so in that sense, it doesn't really matter whether we do C0, C1, C2, because it's just going to be about how many of those we have, right? But it, it should tell you, like, if you have an H1, uh, if, if you have an H1 space, like a C0 finite element mesh is a reasonable place to begin. Although we'll find in finite dimensions, it may actually be better to do C1 or C2. So the, the, the K value we're getting is the minimum we need. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But higher order are going to be possibly more accurate. That's right. For a given number of functions that we have, there may be reasons to use um, more functions that are smoother. Smooth means higher K. Yep. Okay. Okay, so th this is like the whole foundation of numerical methods, like of fi like the finite element method. It, it, this is like the, I mean, this is really the, a much more powerful way to think about what we're doing than maybe just thinking about nodal finite elements or, and so for the engineers who are taking this class, uh, and especially if you're doing it for credit, uh, it's not something to get discouraged about. I have no expectation that you're going to have a really nice understanding of these concepts in the first week of the class. But as the class progresses and we do practical problems in the context of these mathematical ideas, you'll be able to return to them again and again. And these concepts will become very practical to you over time. And that's a much stronger foundation um, and really for spline-based finite elements, it's the only way to go. 
it's the only way to really understand, have enough understanding of the methods to make any, any progress. And so um, it, it, if you're doing the homework and you have really struggling, that's fine. We'll, we'll just keep coming back to this and over time you'll develop that skill set. I'm only going to have, I'm going to have a mathematical preliminaries one, which is what we're going through now. Then later in the course, I'm going to probably have a mathematical preliminaries two, which is going to be all the uh, tensor and vector calculus. So that, that will be important for continuing mechanics. Um, but these are, this is really the foundation um, for the next little while. Okay, um, I appreciate your time. Any just last questions or comments? Uh, when is your office hour? My office hours is just going to be by, <clears throat> well, I mean, you might as well just send me an email and I'll meet you whenever you can. I mean, there's not really, um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't scheduled any specific office hours. It's just whenever you need to meet with me, really because it's going to be over Zoom regardless. You got it, thanks. OK, thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Right. Thank you. Dr. Scott? Yeah. Will these Zoom recordings be posted on Learning Suite or something for future reference? Yeah, I forgot to do the first with? one. I, I didn't do the first one, but I did record this one. So as soon as it comp Zoom compiles it, I'll post it on the wiki. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody.